Hi everybody, welcome to the second vodcast in our unit on energetics. Here we're going to focus on enzymes, how they function, what they are, uh, and also reintroduce us to oxidation and reduction reactions. So here we go. Um, enzymes. All right, what are they? They are proteins, and they are a very special group of proteins uh, because they are our catalysts. They are the molecules that are going to speed up reactions. Um, they have some pretty important characteristics. Um, like I said, they speed up the reactions. They aren't there to create anything new. They are not part of it. Uh, they just purely promote these reactions they are reusable so once we take an enzyme and it does its thing with a reaction it can move on to another substrate and do the same thing they are extraordinarily specific in the reaction that they work on so even if it's a reversible reaction like what we talked about in the last podcast one enzyme will work in one direction another enzyme would take it the other way so if one enzyme builds up a molecule another enzyme would be responsible for the breakdown aspect so let's take a little look at a fun example here i know at my house in may the backyard and through the summer is alight with fireflies and i love watching them and it's so much fun so i'm sure Many of you, I know I used to, would go around and try to catch fireflies. Well, their glowing is what we call a form of bioluminescence, which is really cool. They have this protein in them uh, called luciferin, and luciferin is a protein that when a particular enzyme called luciferase works on it, basically binds to the protein, acts as a catalyst, to allow oxygen to bind to the luciferin. And when it does that, photons are released producing light. And then um, basically that uh, oxidated um, luciferin um, is inactive afterwards. So it's that's what the catalyst does. It binds oxygen to it to allow it to glow. Kind of neat. Now, the substrate that an enzyme works on. A substrate is just another fancy word for reactants. We all know that a reactant is what goes into a reaction and you get the products out. So the enzyme, it, the way that it works to speed it up is that it basically makes it more likely for molecules to bump into each other, okay? We need that collision energy. It needs to be a slam and, you know, bam. Um, event to make that reaction happen so that's what we call the activation energy and what an enzyme does is it brings it down it lowers the activation energy because in all honesty we're too cold um, a lot of life is just too cold to get that collision energy to what it needs to be in order to cause a reaction to happen so in essence, the enzyme allows for the same reaction to happen, which would normally need a really, really high activation energy, okay? And in really what that means is high temperature and drops it down so that the same reaction can happen in the same amount of time, but with less needed energy, ultimately, which means less heat, lower temperature. So as I've mentioned, enzymes are proteins they are very 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 dependent on their structure just like any protein so take a second remind yourself about the levels of protein structure well within that level of twists and coils and beta sheets and alpha helices there's an area that is structured very specifically known as the active site this is the area in the enzyme where the substrate binds to the enzyme itself and that's going to um, cause, in a lot of ways, sometimes that protein to shift its shape a little bit, okay? And what happens is, this is what we call the induced fit or the lock and key model. So here you see, first, the yellow a rectangle. That yellow rectangle is the substrate. It's coming into the enzyme in that very specific shape. We get the cleaving of that molecule and the products, which are two smaller molecules, are released just a little bit more about an active site. Okay, 
catalase. You guys are going to see catalase in the classroom. This is an enzyme in all of us. If you've ever wondered why um, hydrogen peroxide bubbles when you put it on a cut to clean it out, well, you know, wonder no more because here's what's going on. Catalase is responsible for breaking down um, hydrogen peroxide. This is pretty important. And you will see the same kind of um, description in your text as well. So if you want to go to that too, you can spend a little time there. It basically works to break hydrogen peroxide down into water and oxygen bubbles. Okay, so I won't give too much away, but you guys are going to see this in class. Okay, um, so take note of that. The enzyme demonstration you'll want to remember. Um, and what's really important is that it basically binds into this area. Now, take a peek at how big an enzyme is compared to its substrate. Okay, so look here. It's really, really important that we recognize how this protein structure is so critical to how the enzyme works. You can see here that this hydrogen peroxide molecule, which is this, okay, creates hydrogen bonds, okay, that are formed and then basically come around the iron here in the enzyme binds to the oxygen here cleaving this okay and then a bond forms between this and here voila water is removed oxygen's left with a heme group inside of it it's very similar to the same heme group we find in hemoglobin okay so just keep a thought on that a little bit so the induced fit model, we've mentioned this. Um, we'll be doing a worksheet in class, so I just want to call your attention to this. It has a lot of information, and basically we'll work through what this lock and key, or what we call the induced fit model, works. Um, and what happens is the lock and key model, the enzyme comes in and is, you know, binds to the substrate. There's a straining on the chemical bonds, which either breaks them or helps to put them into a place where it's more likely that they'll combine, okay? So you get sort of this idea of a spontaneous reaction as a result. So it's kind of cool. So what are the mechanisms? Well, we need to get the substances together. That's the most likely chance to have a reaction. Again, think about that collision energy. So you increase the local concentration. The orientation of the molecules is critical because we want to make sure that they fit the active site and we want to promote acid-base reaction, okay? And in especially in a nonpolar environment, the idea is you definitely want to shut out water. So what types of things are going to influence enzyme activity? Well, first and foremost, because the majority of enzymes are proteins, like all proteins, they are particularly sensitive to shifts in temperature um, and most importantly shifts to very, very high temperature. We know that high temperature is going to cause a protein to fall apart or denature. Okay. Um, keep this in the back of your head because I'm going to come back to this and we'll talk about this in class. Um, but Siamese cats uh, have a very um, interesting um, effect based on temperature and the, their pigmentation in their coloration of their fur. So we'll come back to that. Other things that are going to influence enzyme activity, the pH. Alter the pH outside um, of its normal range and you're going to cause the enzyme to denature. Now that's a big deal because it could cause issues with the active site, make the active site not fit uh, the substrate itself and then you don't get an enzyme that works anymore. So pay close attention to this next piece. It's going to show you what I mean. So here I have an enzyme. All of those extra H bonds cause the active site not to fit. And if the substrate can't fit, you're done. Salinity. That's something that can affect how well an enzyme works, how salty um, a particular um, substance is. And the cofactors. Cofactors are your little enzyme helper routers, and they actually uh, can basically make an enzyme work more efficiently and work faster uh, and be more likely to attach to a substrate. P.S. Those are what your vitamins are for that you take all the time, like vitamin C. That's a coenzyme. Okay. So some other coenzymes are NAD+, FAD, NADP+. Um, these are electron acceptors. You also have hydrogen ions. Uh, 
hugely important these coenzymes will come into play in cell respiration and photosynthesis we've got metal ions those are important to cytochrome proteins um, cyto means cell chrome means color so these are proteins that are pigment proteins um, and they play a pretty big role um, and if there's a shortage or some kind of deficiency in a particular cofactor then it won't allow the enzyme to work as well so um, there are ways that we have to control our enzyme function and what we have are feedback methods that do this and what we call aeros allosteric control of the enzyme okay in some cases you have an enzyme that acts as an activator um, if you look over here what you're going to see okay is here we have an allosteric activator notice that it fits perfectly right into here well as soon as it excuse me as soon as it does this if it fits in okay all of a sudden the active site becomes structured in a way that the substrate can fit in as long as the um, allosteric activator is there then the enzyme can do its job okay so that would be an activator now if you have an inhibitor which means to stop if this particular allosteric inhibitor binds now the sub the active site has shifted in a way where the substrate can't bind speaking of cats here's mine um so that's just another way the inhibitor okay that's what we mean by the allosteric control okay activator or inhibitor proteins will alter the active site structure if it's an activator it's going to make it so the substrate can fit if it's an inhibitor it's going to prevent the substrate from binding now feedback control this is what we talk about when we discuss um, an actual end product here acting on a particular enzyme to prevent overproduction of the end product so basically once I make a ton of the end product it will actually go back to shut down this particular metabolic pathway so note here tryptophan when I get it in really high amounts it will actually come back to this first enzyme here and shut it down so that it can't work anymore okay this allows us to prevent overproduction um, it you know conserves some energy um, and basically helps to hold on to resources because maybe you just don't need to make so much of it oh and PS tryptophan is an amino acid in case you were wondering all right, so electron transfers. This is going to be very, very important in many chemical reactions. And here's where we're gonna come back to our redox reactions. So we can't forget our redox reactions. We can't forget the idea of Leo says Ger. Um, and if you don't remember what that was all about, okay, see if you can remind yourself what this means. I know we've mentioned it in class. Cells uh, basically conserve their energy by transferring electrons. Um, and they, they're allowed to take these reactions and instead of it being like, ba-bam, this crazy explosion of energy, if you will, it can chunk it down and slow it down into a um, controllable release. So it takes that amount of potential energy that would just be like woofed out and slows it down. Electron transport systems. We talked about this in the summer reading. Um, again, this is um, to allow for that controlled release. Okay, the ETS is a big part of our buildup of ATP in cell respiration. So they're going to be very important. It's also a very important piece to photosynthesis, which is what this diagram is showing. It's taking um, excess electrons, bouncing them through proteins, and in particular, um, proteins that are embedded in a membrane, the membrane of the chloroplast, and slowly releasing energy at every transfer to allow for the production um, of ATP. So this is just, again, sneak peek. So we like to control the release because otherwise it would be too crazy if we didn't and this also um, allows for the setup of electrical gradients in particular hydrogen ions um, so that we can concentrate them on one side 
and then uh, one side of a membrane and then flush them through for the promotion and the creation of ATP molecules. And it gives us a manageable source of potential energy. All right, so I want you to take all of this and kind of stick it in your back pocket, ATP. We've talked about it, we know how important it is. So from here on out, we're gonna spend some time talking about the um, nitty gritty pieces of how cells actually build up their stores of ATP molecules. So I hope you're looking forward to that. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun with it. So have a great night, everybody.